Chapter Fifteen of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter Fifteen. Two Unlike Little Cousins. Whitefoot the Wood, or Deer Mouse, and Danny Meadow Mouse, also called Field Mouse. Whitefoot the Wood Mouse is one of the smallest of the little people who live in the green forest. Being so small, he is one of the most timid. You see, by day and by night, sharp eyes are watching for Whitefoot, and he knows it. Never one single instant. While he is outside, where sharp eyes of hungry enemies may see him, does he forget that they are watching for him? To forget even for one little minute might mean, well, it might mean the end of little Whitefoot, but a dinner for some one with a liking for tender mouse. So Whitefoot, the wood mouse, rarely ventures more than a few feet from a hiding place and safety. At the tiniest sound, he starts nervously and often darts back into hiding without waiting to find out if there really is any danger. If he waited to make sure, he might wait too long, and it is better to be safe than sorry. If you and I had as many real frights in a year, not to mention false frights as Whitefoot has in a day, we would, I suspect, lose our minds. Certainly, we would be the most unhappy people in all the great world. But Whitefoot isn't unhappy, not a bit of it. He is a very happy little fellow. There is a great deal of wisdom in that pretty little head of his. There is more real sense in it than in some very big heads. When some of his neighbors make fun of him for being so very, very timid, he doesn't try to pretend that he isn't afraid. He doesn't get angry. He simply says, of course I'm timid, very timid indeed. I'm afraid of almost everything. I would be foolish not to be. It is because I am afraid that I am alive and happy right now. I hope I shall never be less timid than I am now, for it would mean that sooner or later I would fail to run in time, and would be gobbled up. It isn't cowardly to be timid when there is danger all around, nor is it bravery to take a foolish and needless risk, so I seldom go far from home. It isn't safe for me, and I know it. This being the way Whitefoot looked at matters, you can guess how he felt when Chatterer the Red Squirrel caught sight of him and gave him Old Mother Nature's message. "'Hi there, Mr. Frady!' shouted Chatterer, as he caught sight of Whitefoot darting under a log. "'Hi there! I've got a message for you!' Slowly, cautiously, Whitefoot poked his head out from beneath the old log and looked up at Chatterer. "'What kind of message?' he demanded suspiciously. "'A message you'll do well to heed. It is from Old Mother Nature,' replied Chatterer. "'A message from Old Mother Nature?' cried Whitefoot, and came out a bit more from beneath the old log. "'That's what I said. A message from Old Mother Nature, and if you will take my advice you will heed it,' reported Chatterer. "'She says you are to come to school with the rest of us at sun-up to-morrow morning.' Then Chatterer explained about the school, and where it was held each morning, and what a lot he and his friends had already learned there. Whitefoot listened with something very like dismay in his heart. That place where the school was held was a long way off. That is, it was a long way for him, though to Peter Rabbit or Jumper the Hare it wouldn't have seemed long at all. It meant that he'd have to leave all his hiding places, and the thought made him shiver. But old Mother Nature had sent for him, and not once did he even think of disobeying. "'Did you say that school begins at sun-up?' he asked, and when Chatterer nodded, Whitefoot sighed. It was a sigh of relief. "'I am glad of that,' said he. "'I can travel in the night, which will be much safer. I'll be there. That is, I will if I'm not caught on the way.' Meanwhile, over on the green meadows, Peter Rabbit was looking for Danny Meadow Mouse. Danny's home was not far from the dear old briar-patch, and he and Peter were and still are very good friends, so Peter knew just about where to look for Danny, and it didn't take him long to find him. "'Hello, Peter. You look as if you have something very important on your mind,' was the greeting of Danny Meadow Mouse as Peter came hurrying up. 
"'I have,' said Peter. "'It is a message for you. "'Old Mother Nature says for you to be on hand at sun-up to-morrow, "'when school opens over in the green forest. "'Of course you will be there.' "'Of course,' replied Danny, in the most matter-of-fact tone. "'Of course, if Old Mother Nature really sent me that message.' "'She really did,' interrupted Peter. "'There isn't anything for me to do but obey,' finished Danny. "'Then his face became very sober. "'That is a long way for me to go, Peter,' said he. "'I wouldn't take such a long journey for anything, or for anybody else.' old mother nature knows and if she sent for me she must be sure i can make the trip safely what time did you say i must be there at sun-up replied peter shall i call for you on my way there danny shook his head then he began to laugh what are you laughing at demanded peter at the very idea of me with my short legs trying to keep up with you replied danny i wish you would sit up and take a good look all around to make sure that Old Man Coyote, and Reddy Fox, and Redtail the Hawk, and Black Pussy, that pesky cat from Farmer Brown's, are nowhere about. Peter obligingly sat up, and looked this way, and looked that way, and looked the other way. No one of whom he or Danny Meadow Mouse need be afraid of was to be seen. He said as much, then asked, "'Why did you want to know, Danny?' "'Because I'm going to start off at once,' replied Danny." "'Start for where?' asked Peter, looking much puzzled. "'Start for school, of course,' replied Danny, rather shortly. "'But school doesn't begin until sun-up to-morrow,' protested Peter. "'Which is just the reason I am going to start now,' retorted Danny. "'If I should put off starting until the last minute, I might not get there at all. "'I would have to hurry, and it is difficult to hurry and watch for danger at the same time.' I've noticed that people who put things off to the last minute, and then have to hurry, are quite apt to rush headlong into trouble. The way is clear now, so I am going to start. I can take my time and keep a proper watch for danger. I'll see you over there in the morning, Peter. Danny turned and disappeared in one of his private little paths through the tall grass. Peter noticed that he was headed towards the green forest. When Peter and the others arrived for school the next morning, they found Whitefoot, the Wood Mouse, and Danny Meadow Mouse waiting with Old Mother Nature. Safe in her presence, they seemed to have lost much of their usual timidity. Whitefoot was sitting on the end of a log, and Danny was on the ground just beneath him. "'I want all the rest of you to look well at these two little cousins, and notice how unlike two cousins can be.' said old mother nature whitefoot who is quite as often called deer mouse as wood mouse is one of the prettiest of the entire mouse family i suspect he is called deer mouse because the upper part of his coat is such a beautiful fawn colour notice that the upper side of his long slim tail is of the same colour while the under side is white as is the whole under part of whitefoot also those dainty feet are white hence his name See what big, soft, black eyes he has, and notice that those delicate ears are of good size. His tail is covered with short, fine hairs, instead of being naked, as is the tail of Nibbler, the house mouse, of whom I will tell you later. Whitefoot loves the green forest, but out in parts of the far west, where there is no green forest, he lives on the brushy plains. He is a good climber, and quite at home in the trees. There he seems almost like a tiny squirrel. Tell us, Whitefoot, where you make your home and what you eat. My home just now, replied Whitefoot, is in a certain hollow, in a certain dead limb of a certain tree. I suspect that a member of the woodpecker family made that hole. But no one was living there when I found it. Mrs. Whitefoot and I have made a soft, warm nest there, and wouldn't trade homes with anyone. "'We have had our home in a hollow log on the ground, in an old stump, "'in a hole we dug in the ground under a rock, "'and in an old nest of some bird. "'That was in a tall bush. "'We roof that nest over and make a little round doorway on the underside. "'Once we raised a family in a box in a dark corner of Farmer Brown's sugar camp. "'I eat all sorts of things, seeds, nuts, insects, and meat, when I can get it. I store up food for the winter, as all wise and thrifty people do. 
"'I suppose that means that you do not sleep as Johnny Chuck does in the winter,' remarked Peter Rabbit. "'I should say not,' exclaimed Whitefoot. "'I like winter. It is fun to run about on the snow. Haven't you ever seen my tracks, Peter?' "'I have, lots of times,' spoke up Jumper the Hare. "'Also, I've seen you skipping about after dark. I guess you don't care much for sunlight.' "'I don't,' replied Whitefoot. "'I sleep most of the time, during the day, and work and play at night. "'I feel safer then. "'But on dull days I often come out. "'It is the bright sunlight I don't like. "'That is one reason I stick to the green forest. "'I don't see how Cousin Danny stands it out there on the green meadows. "'Now I guess it is his turn.' "'Everyone looked at Danny Meadow Mouse. "'In appearance he was as unlike Whitefoot as it was possible to be, and still be a mouse. There was nothing pretty or graceful about Danny. He wasn't dainty at all. His body was rather stout, looking stouter than it really was because his fur was quite long. His head was blunt, and he seemed to have no neck at all, though of course he did have one. His eyes were small, like little black beads. His ears were almost hidden in his hair. His legs were short, and his tail was quite short, as if it had been cut off when half grown. No, those two cousins didn't look a bit alike. Danny felt most uncomfortable, as the others compared him with pretty Whitefoot. He knew he was homely, but never before had he felt it quite so keenly. Old Mother Nature saw and understood. "'It isn't how we look.' "'But what we are, and what we do, and how we fit into our particular places in life that count,' said she. "'Now Danny is a homely little fellow, but I know, and I know that he knows, that he is just fitted for the life he lives, and he lives it more successfully for being just as he is. "'Danny is a lover of the fields and meadows, where there is just little else but grass in which to hide. "'Everything about him is just suited for living there. Isn't that so, Danny?' "'Yes, um, I guess so,' replied Danny. "'Sometimes my tail does seem dreadfully short to look well.' Everybody laughed, even Danny himself. Then he remembered how once Reddy Fox had so nearly caught him that one of Reddy's black paws had touched the tip of his tail. Had that tail been any longer, Reddy would have caught him by it. Danny's face cleared, and he hastened to declare, "'After all, my tail suits me.' "'Just as it is.' "'Wisely spoken, Danny,' said old Mother Nature. "'Now it is your turn to tell how you live and what you eat "'and anything else of interest about yourself.' "'I guess there isn't much interesting about me,' began Danny modestly. "'I am just one of those plain, common little folks. "'I guess everybody knows me so well there is nothing for me to tell.' "'Some of them may know all about you, but I don't.' declared Jumper the Hare. I never go out on the green meadows where you live. How do you get about in all that tall grass? Oh, that's easy enough, replied Danny. I cut little paths in all directions. Just the way I do in the dear old briar patch, interrupted Peter Rabbit. I keep those little paths clear and clean so that there never is anything in my way to trip me up when I have to run for safety, continued Danny. "'When the grass gets tall, those little paths are almost like little tunnels. "'The time I dread most is when Farmer Brown cuts the grass for hay. "'I not only have to watch out for that dreadful mowing machine, "'but when the hay has been taken away, the grass is so short "'that it is hard work for me to keep out of sight. "'I sometimes dig a short burrow, and at the end of it make a nice nest of dry grass. "'Sometimes in summer... Mrs. Danny and I make our nests on the surface of the ground in a hollow, or in a clump of tall grass, especially if the ground is low and wet. We have several good-sized families in a year. All meadow mice believe in large families, and that is probably why there are more meadow mice than any other mice in the country. I forgot to say that I am also called field mouse. "'And it is because there are so many of your family, and they require so much to eat, "'that you do a great deal of damage to grass and other crops,' spoke up Old Mother Nature. "'You see,' she explained to the others, "'Danny eats grass, clover, bulbs, roots, seeds, and garden vegetables. "'He also eats some insects. 
he sometimes puts away a few seeds for the winter, but depends chiefly on finding enough to eat, for he is active all winter. He tunnels about under the snow in search of food. When other food is hard to find, he eats bark, and then he sometimes does great damage in young orchards. He gnaws the bark from young fruit trees all the way around as high as he can reach, and of course this kills the trees. He is worse than Peter Rabbit. Danny didn't mention that he is a good swimmer and not at all afraid of the water. No one has more enemies than he, and the fact that he is alive and here at school this morning is due to his everlasting watchfulness. This will do for today. Tomorrow we will take up others of the mouse family. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter Sixteen. Danny's Northern Cousins and Nimbleheels. The Banded Brown Lemmings and the Jumping Mouse. Whitefoot the Wood Mouse and Danny Meadow Mouse had become so interested that they decided they couldn't afford to miss the next lesson. Neither did either of them feel like making the long journey to his home and back again. So Whitefoot found a hole in a stump nearby and decided to camp out there for a few days. Danny decided to do the same thing in a comfortable place under a pile of brush not far away. So the next morning both were on hand when school opened. I told you yesterday that I would tell you about some of Danny's cousins, began Old Mother Nature, just as Chatterer the Red Squirrel, who was late, came hurrying up quite out of breath. Way up in the far north are two of Danny's cousins more closely related to him than to any other members of the mouse family. Yet, strange to say, they are not called mice at all, but lemmings. However, they belong to the mouse family. Bandy, the banded lemming, is the most interesting, because he is the one member of the entire family who changes the color of his coat. In summer he wears beautiful shades of reddish-brown and gray, but in winter his coat is wholly white. He is also called the Hudson Bay Lemming. Danny Meadow Mouse thinks his tail is short, but he wouldn't if he should see Bandy's tail. That is so short it hardly shows beyond his long fur. He is about Danny's size, but a, a little stouter and stockier, and his long fur makes him appear even thicker-bodied than he really is. He has very short legs, and his ears are so small that they are quite hidden in the fur around them, so that he appears to have no ears at all. In that same far northern country is a close relative called the brown lemming. He is very much like Bandy, save that he is all brown and does not change his coat in winter. Both have the same general habits, and these are much like the habits of Danny Meadow Mouse. They make short burrows in the ground, leading to snug, warm nests of grass and moss. In winter they make little tunnels in every direction under the snow, with now and then an opening to the surface. There are many more brown lemmings than banded lemmings, and their little paths run everywhere through the grass and moss. In that country there is a great deal of moss. It covers the ground just as grass does here. But the most interesting thing about these lemmings is the way they migrate. To migrate is to move from one part of the country to another. You know most of the birds migrate to the sunny south every autumn and back every spring. Once in a while it happens that food becomes very scarce where the lemmings are. Then very many of them get together, just as migrating birds form great flocks, and start on a long journey in search of a place where there is plenty of food. They form a great army and push ahead, regardless of everything. They swim wide rivers and even lakes which may lie in their way. Of course they eat everything eatable in their path. "'My!' exclaimed Danny Meadow Mouse. 
I'm glad I don't live in a country where I might have to make such long journeys. I don't envy those cousins up there in the far north a bit. I'm perfectly satisfied to live right on the green meadows. Which shows your good common sense, said Old Mother Nature. By the way, Danny, I suppose you are acquainted with Nimbleheels the Jumping Mouse, who also is rather fond of the green meadows. I ought to have sent word to him to be here this morning. Hardly were the words out of Old Mother Nature's mouth when something landed in the leaves almost at her feet and right in the middle of school. Instantly Danny Meadow Mouse scurried under a pile of dead leaves. Whitefoot the Wood Mouse darted into a knot hole in the log on which he had been sitting. Jumper the Hare dodged behind a little hemlock tree. Peter Rabbit bolted for a hollow log. Striped Chipmunk vanished in a hole under an old stump. Johnny Chuck backed up against the trunk of a tree and made ready to fight. Only Happy Jack the Gray Squirrel and Chatterer the Red Squirrel and Prickly Porky the Porcupine, who were sitting in trees, kept their places. You see, they felt quite safe. As soon as all those who had run had reached places of safety, they peeped out to see what had frightened them so. Just imagine how very, very foolish they felt when they saw old Mother Nature smiling down at a little fellow just about the size of little Whitefoot, but with a much longer tail. It was Nimbleheels the Jumping Mouse. "'Well, well, well!' exclaimed old Mother Nature. "'I was just speaking of you and wishing I had you here. How did you happen to come? And what did you mean by scaring my pupils half out of their wits?' Her eyes twinkled. Nimbleheels saw this and knew that she was only pretending to be severe. Before he could reply, Johnny Chuck began to chuckle. The chuckle became a laugh, and presently Johnny was laughing so hard he had to hold his sides. Now, as you know, laughter is catching. In a minute or so, everybody was laughing, and no one but Johnny Chuck knew what the joke was. At last Peter Rabbit stopped laughing long enough to ask Johnny what he was laughing at. <laughs> "'It's the idea of that little pinch of nothing giving us all such a fright,' replied Johnny Chuck. Then all laughed some more. When they were through laughing, Nimbleheels answered Old Mother Nature's questions. He explained that he had heard about that school, as by this time almost everyone in the Green Forest and on the Green Meadows had. By chance he learned that Danny Meadow Mouse was attending. He thought that if it was a good thing for Danny, it would be a good thing for him. So he had come. Just as I was almost here, I heard a twig snap behind me, or, or thought I did, and I jumped so as to get here and be safe. I didn't suppose anyone would be frightened by little me, he explained. It was some jump, exclaimed Jumper the Hare admiringly. He went right over my head, and I was sitting up at that. "'It isn't much of a jump to go over your head,' replied Nibbleheels. "'You ought to see me when I really try to jump. "'I wasn't half trying when I landed here. "'I'm sorry I frightened all of you so. "'It gives me a queer feeling just to think that I should be able to frighten anybody. "'If you please, Mother Nature, am I in time for today's lesson?' Oh, "'Not for all of it, but, but you are just in time for the part I wanted you here for,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'Hop up on that log, side of your cousin Whitefoot.' where all can see you. Nibbleheels hopped up beside Whitefoot the Wood Mouse, and as the two little cousins sat side by side, they were not unlike in general appearance, though of the two Whitefoot was the prettier. The coat of Nibbleheels was a dull yellowish, darker on the back than on the sides. Like Whitefoot, he was white underneath. His ears were much smaller than those of Whitefoot, but the greatest differences between the two were in their hind legs and tails. The hind legs and feet of Nimbleheels were long, on the same plan as those of Peter Rabbit, but just to glance at them anyone would know that he was a born jumper and a good one. Whitefoot possessed a long tail, but the tail of Nimbleheels was much longer, slim, and tapering. There said old mother nature is the greatest jumper for his size among all the animals in this great country when i say this i mean the greatest ground jumper timmy the flying squirrel jumps farther 
but Timmy has to climb to a high place and then coasts down on the air. I told you what wonderful jumps Jack Rabbit can make, but if he could jump as high and far for his size as Nimbleheels can jump for his size, the longest jump Jack has ever made would seem nothing more than a hop. By the way, both Nimbleheels and Whitefoot have small pockets in their cheeks. Tell us where you live, Nimbleheels. I live among the weeds, along the edge of the green meadows, replied Nimbleheels, though sometimes I go way out on the green meadows. But I like best to be among the weeds, because they are tall and keep me well hidden, and also because they furnish me plenty to eat. You see, I live largely on seeds, though I am also fond of berries and small nuts, especially beech nuts. Some of my family prefer the green forest, especially if there is laughing brook or pond in it. Personally, I prefer, as I said before, the edge of the green meadows. "'Do you make your home under the ground?' asked Striped Chipmunk. "'For winter, yes,' replied Nimbleheels. "'In summer I sometimes put my nest just a few inches underground, but, but often I hide it under a piece of bark or in a thick clump of grass, just as Danny Meadow Mouse often does his. In the fall I dig a deep burrow, deep enough to be beyond the reach of Jack Frost, and in a nice little bedroom down there I sleep the winter away.' I have little storerooms down there, too, in which I put seeds, berries, and nuts. Then, when I do wake up, I have plenty to eat. I might add, said Old Mother Nature, that when he goes to sleep for the winter, he curls up in a little ball with his long tail wrapped around him, and in his bed of soft grass he sleeps very sound indeed. Like Johnny Chuck, he gets very fat before going to sleep. Now, Nimbleheels, show us how you can jump. Nimbleheels hopped down from the log on which he had been sitting, and at once shot into the air in such a high, long, beautiful jump that everybody exclaimed. This way and that way he went in great leaps. It was truly wonderful. "'That long tail is what balances him,' explained Old Mother Nature. "'If he should lose it, he would simply turn over and over and never know where or how he was going to land.' His jumping is done only in times of danger. When he is not alarmed, he runs about on the ground like the rest of the mouse family. This is all for today. Tomorrow I will tell you still more about the mouse family. End of chapter 16. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader and Dorothy Leader. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 17. Three Little Red Coats and Some Others. The Pine Mouse, red-backed mouse, rufous tree mouse, rock mouse, and beach mouse. With Whitefoot the wood mouse, Danny Meadow Mouse, and Nimbleheels the jumping mouse attending school, the mouse family was well represented. But when school opened the morning after Nimbleheels had made his sudden and startling appearance, there was still another present. It was Piney the Pine Mouse. Whitefoot, who knew him, had hunted him up and brought him along. I thought you wouldn't mind if Piney came, explained Whitefoot. I'm glad he has come, replied Old Mother Nature. It is much better to see a thing than merely to be told about it, and now you have a chance to see for yourself the difference between two cousins very closely related. Danny Meadow Mouse and Piney the Pine Mouse. What difference do you see, Happy Jack Squirrel? Piney's a little smaller than Danny, though he has much the same shape, was the prompt reply. Two, replied old Mother Nature. Now, striped chipmunk, what difference do you see? The fur of Piney's coat is shorter, finer, and has more of a shine. Then, too, there is more of a reddish brown than Danny's, replied striped chipmunk. And what do you say, Peter Rabbit? asked old Mother Nature. Piney has a shorter tail, declared Peter, and everybody laughed. 
trust you to look at his tail first, said old Mother Nature. These are the chief differences as far as looks are concerned. Their habits differ in about the same degree. As you all know, Danny cuts little paths through the grass. Piney doesn't do this, but makes little tunnels just under the surface of the ground, very much as Miner the Mole does. He isn't fond of the open green meadows or of damp places that Danny is, but likes best the edge of the green forest and brushy places. He is very much at home in the poorly kept orchard where the weeds are allowed to grow, and in young orchards he does a great deal of damage by cutting off the roots of the young trees and stripping off the bark as high as he can reach. Tell us, Piney, how and where you make your home. Piney hesitated a little, for he was bashful. I make my home underground, he ventured finally. I dig a nice little bedroom with several entrances from my tunnels, and in it I make a fine nest of soft grass. Close by, I dig one or more rooms in which to store my food, and these usually are bigger than my bedroom. When I get one filled with food, I close it up by filling the entrance with earth. What do you put in your storerooms? asked Peter Rabbit. Short pieces of grass and pieces of roots of different kinds, replied Piney. I am very fond of tender roots and the bark of trees and bushes. And he dearly loves to get in the garden where he can tunnel along a row of potatoes or other root crops, added Old Mother Nature. Because of these habits, he does a great deal of damage and is much disliked by man. Striped Chipmunk mentioned his reddish-brown coat. There is another cousin with a coat of red that he is called the red-backed mouse. He is about the size of Danny Meadow Mouse, but has larger ears and a longer tail. This little fellow is a lover of the green forest, and he is quite as active by day as by night. He is pretty, especially when he sits up to eat holding his food in his paws as does Happy Jack Squirrel. He makes his home in a burrow, the entrance to which is under an old stump, a rock, or the root of a tree. His nest is of soft grass or moss. Sometimes he makes it in a hollow log or stump instead of digging a bedroom underground. He is thrifty and lays up a supply of food in underground rooms, hollow logs, and similar places. He eats seeds, small fruits, roots, and various plants. Because of his preference for the green forest and the fact that he lives as a rule far from homes of men, he does little real damage. There is still another little red coat in the family, and he is especially interesting, because while he is related to Danny Meadow Mouse, he lives almost wholly in trees. He is called the Rufus Tree Mouse. Rufus means reddish-brown, and he gets that name because of the color of his coat. He lives in the great forests of the far west, where the trees are so big and tall that the biggest tree you have ever seen would look like small beside them, and it is in those great trees that the Rufus tree mouse lives. Just why he took to living in trees, no one knows, for he belongs to that branch of the family known as ground mice. But live in them he does, and he is quite as much at home in them as any squirrel. Chatterer the red squirrel was interested right away. Does he build a nest in a tree like a squirrel, he asked. He certainly does, replied Old Mother Nature, and it is often it is a most remarkable nest. In some sections he places it only in big trees, sometimes a hundred feet from the ground. In other sections, it is placed in small trees and only a few feet above the ground. The high nests often are old, deserted nests of squirrels, enlarged and built over. Some of them are very large indeed and have been used year after year. Each year they have been added to. One of these big nests will have several bedrooms and little passages running all through it. It appears that Mrs. Rufus usually has one of these big nests to herself. Rufus, having a small nest of his own out on one of the branches, the big nest is close up against the trunk of the tree where several branches meet. Does Rufus travel from one tree to another, or does he live in just one tree? 
asked Happy Jack Squirrel. Wherever branches of one tree touch those of another, and you know in the thick forest this is frequently the case, he travels about freely if he wants to. But those trees are so big that I suspect he spent most of his time in the one which his home is, replied Old Mother Nature. However, if an enemy appears in his home tree, he makes his escape by jumping from one tree to another, just as you would do. What I want to know is where he gets his food if he spends all his time up in the trees, spoke up Danny Meadow Mouse. Old Mother Nature replied, where should he get it but up where he lives, she asked. Rufus never has to worry about food. It is all around him. You see, so far as known, he lives wholly on the thick parts of the needles, which you know are the leaves of the fir and spruce trees, and on the bark of tender twigs. So, you see, he is more of a tree dweller than any of the squirrel family. While Rufus has the general shape of Danny and his relatives, he has quite a long tail. Now, I guess this will do for the nearest relatives of Danny Meadow Mouse. He certainly has a lot of them, remarked Whitefoot the Wood Mouse. Then he added a little wistfully, Of course, in a way, they are all cousins of mine, but I wish I had some a little more closely related. You have, replied Old Mother Nature, and Whitefoot picked up his big ears. One of them, Big Ear the Rot Mouse, who lives out in the mountains in the far west. He is as fond of the rocks as Rufus is of the trees. Sometimes he lives in brush heap and in brush country, but he prefers rocks, and that is why he is known as the rock mouse. He's a pretty little fellow, if anything, a trifle bigger than you, Whitefoot, and he is dressed much like you with a yellowish-brown coat and white waistcoat. He has just such a long tail covered with hair its whole length, but you should see his ears. He has the largest ears of any member of the whole family. That is why he is called Big Ear. He likes best to be out at night, but often comes out on dull days. He eats seeds and small nuts and is especially fond of juniper seeds. He always lays up a supply of food for winter. Often he is found very high up on the mountains. Another of your cousins, Whitefoot, lives along the seashore of the east down in the sunny south. He is called the beach mouse. In general appearance, he is much like you, having the same shape, long tail, and big ears. But he's a little smaller, and his coat varies. When he lives back from the shore in fields where the soil is dark, his upper coat is dark grayish brown, but when he is, lives on the white sands of the seashore, it is very light. His home is in short burrows in the ground. Now, don't you little people think that you have learned enough about the mouse family? You haven't told us about Nibbler the mouse yet, and you said you would, protested Peter Rabbit. And when we were learning about Longfoot, the kangaroo rat, you said he was most closely related to the pocket mice. What about them? said Johnny Chuck. Oh, Mother Nature laughed. I see, said she, that you want to know all there is to know. Be on hand tomorrow morning. I guess we can finish up with the mouse family, and with them, the order of rodents to which all of you belong. End of chapter 17. Recording by John Leader of Bloomington, Illinois and Dorothy Leader of Lutheran Retirement Home of Southern Minnesota. Eighteen of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet Friday The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess Chapter 18 Mice with Pockets and Others The Silky and Spiny Pocket Mice Grasshopper Mouse Harvest Mouse and House Mouse Pockets are very handy things for little people who are thrifty 
and to live largely on small seeds. Without pockets in which to carry the seeds, I am afraid some of them would never be able to store up enough food for winter, began Old Mother Nature as soon as everybody was on hand the next morning. I wouldn't be without my pockets for anything, spoke up Striped Chipmunk. Old Mother Nature smiled. You certainly do make good use of yours, said she, but there are others who have even greater need of pockets, and among them are the pocket mice. Of course, it is because of their pockets that they are called pocket mice. But there are others who have even greater need of pockets, and among them are the pocket mice. Of course, it is because of their pockets that they are called pocket mice. All of these pretty little fellows live in the dry parts of the far west and southwest, in the same region where Longfoot the kangaroo rat lives. They are close neighbors and relatives of his. Midget, the silky pocket mouse, is one of the smallest animals in all the great world, so small that Whitefoot, the wood mouse, is a giant compared with him. He weighs less than an ounce and is a dear little fellow. His back and sides are yellow, and beneath he is white. He has quite long hind legs and a long tail, and these show at once that he is a jumper. In each cheek is a pocket opening from the outside, and these pockets are lined with hair. He is called Silky Pocket Mouse because of the fineness and softness of his coat. He has some larger cousins, one of them being a little bigger than Nibbler the House Mouse. Neighbors and close relatives are the spiny pocket mice. Do they have spines like Prickly Porky? demanded Peter Rabbit. Old Mother Nature laughed. I don't wonder you ask, said she. I think it is a foolish name myself, for they haven't any spines at all. Their fur isn't as fine as that of Midget, and it has all through it long, coarse hairs, almost like bristles, and from these they got their name. The smallest of the spiny pocket mice is about the size of Nibbler the house mouse, and the largest is twice as big. They are more slender than their silky cousins, and their tails are longer in proportion to their size, and have little tufts of hair at the ends. Of course, they have pockets in their cheeks. In habits, all the pocket mice are much alike. They make burrows in the ground, often throwing up a little mound with several entrances which lead to a central passageway connecting with the bedroom and storerooms. By day, the entrances are closed with earth from inside, for the mice are active only at night. Sometimes the burrows are hidden under bushes, and sometimes they are right out in the open. Living as they do in a hot, dry country, the pocket mice have learned to get along without drinking water. Their food consists mainly of a variety of small seeds. Another mouse of the West looks almost enough like Whitefoot to be a member of his branch of the family. He has a beautiful yellowish-brown coat and white waistcoat, and his feet are white. But his tail is short in comparison with Whitefoot's, and instead of being slim, is quite thick. His fur is like velvet. He is called the grasshopper mouse. Is that because he eats grasshoppers? asked Peter Rabbit at once. You've guessed it, laughed Old Mother Nature, 
He is very, very fond of grasshoppers and crickets. He eats many kinds of insects, moths, flies, cutworms, beetles, lizards, frogs, and scorpions. Because of his fondness for the latter, he is called the scorpion mouse in some sections. He is fond of meat when he can get it. He also eats seeds of many kinds. He is found all over the west, from well up in the north to the hot, dry regions of the southwest. When he cannot find a convenient deserted burrow of some other animal, he digs a home for himself and there raises several families each year. In the early evening, he often utters a fine, shrill, whistling call note. Another little member of the mouse family found clear across the country is the harvest mouse. He is never bigger than Nibbler the house mouse and often is much smaller. In fact, he is one of the smallest of the entire family. In appearance, he is much like Nibbler, but his coat is browner and there are fine hairs on his tail. He loves grassy, weedy, or brushy places. As a rule, he does little harm to man, for his food is chiefly seeds of weeds, small wild fruits, and parts of wild plants of no value to man. Once in a while his family becomes so large that they do some damage in grain fields, but this does not happen often. The most interesting thing about this little mouse is the way he builds his home. Sometimes he uses a hole in a tree or post, and sometimes a deserted bird's nest, but more frequently he builds a nest for himself, a little round ball of grass and other vegetable matter. This is placed in thick grass or weeds close to the ground or in bushes or low trees several feet from the ground. They are well-built little houses and have one or more little doorways on the underside when they are in bushes or trees. Inside is a warm, soft bed made of milkweed or cattail down, the very nicest kind of a bed for the babies. No one has a neater home than the harvest mouse. He is quite as much at home in bushes and low trees as Happy Jack Squirrel is in bigger trees. His long tail comes in very handy then, for he often wraps it around a twig to make his footing more secure. Now, this is all about the native mice and... Oh, what is it, Peter? You've forgotten Nibbler the house mouse, replied Peter. How impatient some little folks are, and how fearful that their curiosity will not be satisfied, remarked old Mother Nature. As I was saying, this is all about our native mice, that is, the mice who belong to this country, and now we come to Nibbler the house mouse, who, like Robert the brown rat, has no business here at all, but who has followed man all over the world, and like Robber, has become a pest to man. Peter Rabbit looked rather sheepish when he discovered that old Mother Nature hadn't forgotten, and resolved that in the future he would hold his tongue. "'Have any of you seen Nibbler?' asked Old Mother Nature. "'I have,' replied Danny Meadow Mouse. "'Once I was carried to Farmer Brown's barn in a shock of corn, "'and I found Nibbler living in the barn. "'It is a wonder he wasn't living in Farmer Brown's house,' said Old Mother Nature. "'Probably other members of his family were.' He is perfectly at home in any building put up by man, just as is Robber the Rat. Because of his small size, he can go where Robber cannot. He delights to scamper about between the walls, 
Being a true rodent, he is forever gnawing holes in the corners of rooms and opening on to pantry shelves so that he may steal food. He eats all sorts of food, but spoils more for man by running about over it than he eats. In barns and hen houses, he gets into the grain bins and steals a great deal of grain. It is largely because of Robber the Rat and Nibbler that men keep the cats you all hate so. A cat is Nibbler's worst enemy. Nibbler is slender and graceful, with a long, hairless tail and ears of good size. He is very timid, ready to dart into his hole at the least sound. He raises from four to nine babies at a time, and several sets of them in a year. If Mr. and Mrs. Nibbler are living in a house, their nest is made of scraps of paper, cloth, wool, and other soft things stolen from the people who live in the house. In getting this material, they often do great damage. If they are living in a barn, they make their nest of hay and any soft material they can find. While Nibbler prefers to live in or close to the homes of men, he sometimes is driven out and then takes to the fields, especially in summer. There he lives in all sorts of hiding places and isn't at all particular what the place is if it promises safety and food can be obtained close by. I'm sorry Nibbler ever came to this country. Man brought him here, and now he is here to stay, and quite as much at home as if he belonged here the way the rest of you do. This finishes the lessons on the order of rodents, the animals related by reason of having teeth for the purpose of gnawing. I suspect these are the only ones in whom you take any interest, and so you will not care to come to school any more. Am I right? No, marm, answered Happy Jack the Gray Squirrel, who, you remember, had laughed at Peter Rabbit for wanting to go to school. No, marm, there are ever so many other people of the green forest and the green meadows that we want to know more about than we now know. Isn't that so? Happy Jack turned to the others, and every one nodded, even Prickly Porky. There is one little fellow living right near here who looks to me as if he must be a member of the mouse family, but he isn't like any of the mice you have told us about, continued Happy Jack. He is so small he can hide under a leaf. I'm sure he must be a mouse. You mean Teeny Weeny the Shrew? replied Old Mother Nature, smiling at Happy Jack. He isn't a mouse. He isn't even a rodent. I'll try to have him here tomorrow morning and we will see what we can find out about him and his relatives. End of chapter 18 Recording by Janet Friday Chapter 19 The Burgess Animal Book for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 19 Teeny Weeny and His Cousin, The Common or Long-Tailed Shrew or Shrew Mouse, Short-Tailed Shrew or Mole Shrew, and marsh or water shrew. Of course, old Mother Nature knows, but just the same it is hard for me not to believe that Teeny Weeny is a member of the mouse family, said Happy Jack Squirrel to Peter Rabbit, as they scampered along to school. I never have had a real good look at him, 
but I've had glimpses of him lots of times and always supposed him a little mouse with a short tail. It is hard to believe that he isn't. I hope old Mother Nature will put him where we can get a good look at him, replied Peter. Perhaps when you really see him he won't look so much like a mouse. When all had arrived, old Mother Nature began the morning lesson at once. You have learned about all the families in the order of rodents, said she. So now we will take up another and much smaller order called insectivora. I wonder if any of you can guess what that means. It sounds, said Peter Rabbit, as if it must have something to do with insects. That is a very good guess, Peter, replied Old Mother Nature, smiling at him. It does have to do with insects. The members of this order lives very largely on insects and worms, and the name Intersectivora means insect eating. There are two families in this order, the shrew family and the mole family. Then Teeny Weeny and Miner the Mole must be related, spoke Peter quickly. Right again, Peter, was the prompt reply. The shrews and the moles are related in the same way that you and Happy Jack Squirrel are related. And isn't Teeny Weeny the shrew related to the mice at all? asked Happy Jack. Not at all, said Old Mother Nature. Many people think he is, and often he is called Shrew Mouse. But this is a great mistake. It is the result of ignorance. It seems strange to me that people so often know so little about their near neighbors. She looked at Happy Jack Squirrel as she said this, and Happy Jack looked sheepish. He felt just as he looked. All this time the eyes of everyone had been searching this way, that way, every way, for Teeny Weeny, for Old Mother Nature had promised to try to have him there that morning. But Teeny Weeny was not to be seen. Now and then a leaf on the ground close by Old Mother Nature's feet moved, but the merry little breezes were always stirring up fallen leaves, and no one paid any attention to these. Old Mother Nature understood the disappointment in the faces before her and her eyes began to twinkle. Yesterday I told you that I would try to have Teeny Weeny here, said she. A leaf moved. Stooping quickly she picked it up. And here he is, she finished. Sure enough, where a second before the dead brown leaf had been was a tiny little fellow, so tiny that the leaf had covered him completely, and it wasn't a very big leaf. It was Teeny Weeny the Shrew, also called the Common Shrew, the long-tailed shrew and the shrew mouse, one of the smallest animals in all the great world. He started to dart under another leaf, but Old Mother Nature stopped him. Sit still, she commanded sharply. You have nothing to fear. I want everybody to have a good look at you, for it is high time these neighbors of yours should know you. I know just how nervous and uncomfortable you are, and I'll keep you only a few minutes. Now everybody take a good look at Teeny Weeny. This command was quite needless, for all were staring with all their might. What they saw was a mite of a fellow less than four inches long from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail, and of his total length the tail was almost half. He was slender, had short legs and mouse-like feet. His coat was brownish above and greyish beneath, and the fur was very fine and soft. But the oddest thing about Teeny Weeny was his long, pointed head, ending in a long nose. No mouse has a head like it. The edges of the ears could be seen above the fur, but the eyes were so tiny that Peter Rabbit thought he hadn't any and said so. Old Mother Nature laughed. Yes, he has eyes, Peter, said she. Look closely and you will see them, but they don't amount to much. 
little more than to tell daylight from darkness. Teeny Weeny depends on his nose chiefly. He has a very wonderful little nose, flexible and very sensitive. Of course, with such poor eyes he prefers the dark when there are fewer enemies abroad. All this time Teeny Weeny had been growing more and more uneasy. Old Mother Nature saw and understood. Now she told him that he might go. Hardly were the words out of her mouth when he vanished, darting under some dead leaves. Hidden by them, he made his way to an old log and was seen no more. Doesn't he eat anything but insects and worms? asked Striped Chipmunk. Yes, replied Old Mother Nature. He is very fond of flesh, and if he finds the body of a bird or animal that has been killed, he will tear it to pieces. He is very hot-tempered, as are all his family, and will not hesitate to attack a mouse much bigger than himself. He is so little and so active that he has to have a great deal of food and probably eats his own weight in food every day. Of course, that means he must do a great deal of hunting, and he does. He makes tiny little paths under the fallen leaves and in swampy places, little tunnels through the moss. He is especially fond of old rotted stumps and logs and brush piles for in such places he can find grubs and insects. At the same time he is well hidden. He is active by day and night, but in the daytime takes pains to keep out of the light. He prefers damp to dry places. In winter he tunnels about under the snow. In summer he uses the tunnels and runways of meadow mice and others when he can. He eats seeds and other vegetable food when he cannot find insects or flesh. How about his enemies? asked Chatterer the Red Squirrel. He has plenty, replied Old Mother Nature, but is not so much hunted as the members of the mouse family. This is because he has a strong, unpleasant scent which makes him a poor meal for those at all particular about their food. Some of the hawks and owls appear not to mind this, and these are his worst enemies. Has he any near relatives? asked Jumper the Hare. Several, was the prompt response. Blarina, the short-tailed shrew, also called Mole Shrew, is the best known. He is found everywhere in forests, old pastures and along grassy banks but seldom far from water. He prefers moist ground. He is much larger and thicker than Teeny Weeny and has a shorter tail. People often mistake him for Miner the Mole because of the thick, fine fur which is much like Miner's and his habit of tunnelling about just beneath the surface. But if they would look at his forefeet, they would never make that mistake. They are small and like the feet of the mouse family, not at all like Miner's big shovels. Moreover, he is smaller than Miner, and his tunnels are seldom in the earth but just under the leaves and grass. His food is much the same as that of Teeny Weeny, worms, insects, flesh when he can get it, and seeds. He is fond of beech nuts. He is quite equal to killing a mouse of his own size or bigger and does not hesitate to do so when he gets the chance. He makes a soft, comfortable nest under a log or in a stump or in the ground and has from four to six babies at a time. Teeny Weeny sometimes has as many as ten. The senses of smell and hearing are very keen and make up for the lack of sight. His eyes, like those of other shrews, are probably of use only in distinguishing light from darkness. His coat is dark brownish grey.
Another of the shrew family is the marsh shrew, also called water shrew and black and white shrew. He is longer than either of the others and, as you have guessed, is a lover of water. He is a good swimmer and gets much of his food in the water. Water beetles and grubs and perhaps tadpoles and minnows. Now who among you knows Miner the Mole? I do, that is, I have seen him, replied Peter Rabbit. Very well, Peter. Tomorrow morning we will see how much you know about Miner, replied Old Mother Nature. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty, The Burgess Animal Book for Children」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess Chapter Twenty Four busy little miners, the common mole, brewers or hairy-tailed mole, Oregon mole and star-nosed mole. Scampering along on his way to school and thinking of nothing so uninteresting as watching his steps, Peter Rabbit stubbed his toes. Yes, sir, Peter stubbed his toes. With a little exclamation of impatience, he turned to see what he had stumbled over. It was a little ridge where the surface of the ground had been raised a trifle since Peter had passed that way the day before. Peter chuckled. Now isn't that funny? He demanded of no one at all, for he was quite alone. Then he answered himself. It certainly is, said he. Here I am on my way to learn something about Miner the Mole, and I trip over one of the queer little ridges he is forever making. It wasn't here yesterday, so that means that he is at work right around here now. Hello, I thought so. Peter had been looking along the little ridge and had discovered that it ended only a short distance from him. Now, as he looked, at it again, he saw the flat surface of the ground at the end of the ridge rise as if being pushed up from beneath, and that little ridge became just so much longer. Peter understood perfectly. Out of sight beneath the surface, Miner the Mole was at work. He was digging a tunnel, and that ridge was simply the roof to that tunnel. It was so near the surface of the ground that Miner simply pushed up the loose soil as he bored his way along, and this made the little ridge over which Peter had stumbled. Peter watched a few minutes, then turned and scampered. Liberty, liberty, lip for the green forest. He arrived at school quite out of breath, the last one. Old Mother Nature was about to chide him for being late but noticing his excitement, she changed her mind. "'Well, Peter,' said she, "'what is it now? Did you have a narrow escape on your way here?' Peter shook his head. "'No,' he replied. "'No, I didn't have a narrow escape, but I discovered something.' Happy Jack Squirrel snickered. "'Peter is always discovering something,' said he. He is a great little discoverer. Probably he has just found out that the only way to get anywhere on time is to start soon enough. No such thing, declared Peter indignantly. You... Never mind him, Peter, interrupted Old Mother Nature soothingly. What was it you discovered? That the very one we are to learn about is only a little way from here this very minute. Miner the Mole is at work on the green meadow, close to the edge of the green forest, cried Peter eagerly. I thought perhaps you would want to... 
have this morning's lesson right there, where we can at least see his works, if not himself, interrupted old Mother Nature again. That is fine, Peter. We will go over there at once. It is always better to see things than to merely hear about them. So Peter led the way to where he had stumbled over that little ridge on his way to school. It was longer than when he had left it, but even as the others crowded about to look, the earth was pushed up and it grew in length. Old Mother Nature stooped and made a little hole in that ridge. Then she put her lips close to it and commanded Minor to come out. She spoke softly, pleasantly, but in a way that left no doubt that she expected to be obeyed. She was, almost at once, a queer, long, sharp nose was poked out of the little hole she had made, and a squeaky voice asked fretfully, Do I have to come way out? You certainly do, replied old Mother Nature. I want some of your friends and neighbors to get a good look at you, and they certainly can't do that with only that sharp nose of yours to be seen. Now scramble out here. No one will hurt you. I will keep you only a few minutes. Then you can go back to your everlasting digging. Out with you now. While the others gathered in a little circle close about that hole, there scrambled into view one of the queerest little fellows in all the great world. Few of them had ever seen him close before. He was a stout little fellow, with the softest, thickest grey coat imaginable. He was about six inches long and had a funny, short, pinkish, white, naked tail that at once reminded Peter of an old angleworm. His head seemed to be set directly on his shoulders, so that there was no neck worth mentioning. His nose was long and sharp, and extended far beyond his mouth. Neither ears nor eyes were to be seen. Striped Chipmunk at once wanted to know how Miner could see. He doesn't see as you do, replied Old Mother Nature. He has very small eyes, tiny things, which you might find if you should part the fur around them, but they are of use only to distinguish light from darkness. Miner hasn't the least idea what any of you look like. You see, he spends his life underground and of course has no use for eyes there. They would be a nuisance, for the dirt would be continually getting in them if they were any larger than they are or were not protected as they are. If you should feel of Miner's nose, you would find it hard. That is because he uses it to bore with it in the earth. Just notice those hands of his. At once everybody looked at Miner's hands. No one ever had seen such hands before. The arms were short but looked very strong. The hands also were rather short, but what they lacked in length they made up in width, and they were armed with long, stout claws. But the queer thing about them was the way he held them. He held them turned out. His hind feet were not much different from the hind feet of the mouse family. Miner was plainly uncomfortable. He wriggled about uneasily, and it was very clear that he was there only because old Mother Nature had commanded him to be there, and that the one thing he wanted most was to get back into his beloved ground. Old Mother Nature saw this and took pity on him. She picked him up and placed him on the ground where there was no opening near. Now, Miner, said she, your friends and neighbors have had a good look at you, and I know just how uncomfortable you feel. There is but one thing more I'll ask of you. It is that you will show us how you can dig. Johnny Chuck thinks he is a pretty good digger. Just show him what you can do in that line. Miner didn't wait to be told twice. The instant old Mother Nature stopped speaking, 
he began to push and bore into the earth with his sharp nose. One of those great spade-like hands was slipped up past his face, and the claws driven in beside his nose. Then it was swept back, and the loosened earth with it. The other hand was used in the same way. It was quite plain to everybody why they were turned out in the way they were. There was nothing slow about the way Miner used that boring nose and those shoveling hands. Peter Rabbit had hardly time for half a dozen long breaths before Miner the Mole had disappeared. "'Some digging!' exclaimed Peter. "'Never again, as long as I live, will I boast of my digging,' declared Johnny Chuck admiringly. From the point where Miner had entered the ground, a little ridge was being pushed up, and they watched it grow surprisingly fast as the little worker under the sod pushed his tunnel along in the direction of his old tunnels. It was clear that he was in a hurry to get back where he could work in peace. "'What a queer life!' exclaimed Happy Jack Squirrel. "'He can't have much fun. "'I should think it would be awful living in the dark that way all the time. "'You forget that he cannot see as you can, "'and so prefers the dark,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'As for fun, he gets that in his work. "'He is called Miner because he lives in the ground "'and is always tunnelling. "'What does he eat? The roots of plants?' asked Jumper the Hare. Old Mother Nature shook her head. A lot of people think that, said she, and often Miner is charged with destroying growing crops, eating seed corn, etc. That is because his tunnels are found running along the rows of plants. The fact is, Miner has simply been hunting for grubs and worms around the roots of those plants, he hasn't touched the plants at all. I suspect that Danny Meadow Mouse or one of his cousins could explain who ate the seed corn and the young plants. They are rather fond of using Miner's tunnels when he isn't about. Danny hung his head and looked guilty, but didn't say anything. The only harm Miner does is sometimes to tunnel so close to garden plants that he lets air in around the tender roots, and they dry out, continued old Mother Nature. His food consists almost wholly of worms, grubs, and insects, and he has to have a great many to keep him alive. That is why he is so active. Those tunnels of his, which seem to be without any plan, are made in his search for food. He is especially fond of angleworms. As a matter of fact, he is a useful little fellow. The only time he becomes a nuisance to man is when he makes his little ridges across smooth lawns. Even then he pays for the trouble by destroying the grubs in the grass roots, grubs that in their turn would destroy the grass. When you see his ridges, you may know that his food is close to the surface. When in dry or cold weather, the worms go deep in the ground. Miner follows, and then there is no trace of his tunnels on the surface. Night and day are all the same to him. He works and sleeps when he chooses. In winter he tunnels below the frost line. You all noticed how dense his fur is, that is so the sand cannot work down in it. His home is a snug nest of grass or leaves in a little chamber under the ground in which several tunnels offer easy means of escape in case of sudden danger. Has Miner any near relatives? asked Peter Rabbit. Several, replied Old Mother Nature. All are much alike in the habits. One who lives a little farther north is called Brewer's Mole, or the Hairy-Tailed Mole. His tail is a little longer than Miner's, and is covered with fine hair. The largest and handsomest member of the family is the Oregon Mole of the Northwest. 
His coat is very dark and his fur extremely fine. His ways are much the same as those of Miner, whom you have just met, excepting that when he is tunneling deep in the ground, he pushes the earth to the surface after the manner of grubby gopher, and his mounds become a nuisance to farmers. When he is tunneling just under the surface, he makes ridges exactly like these of his eastern cousin. But the oddest member of the mole family is the star-nosed mole. He looks much like Miner, with the exception of his nose and tail. His nose has a fringe of little fleshy points, twenty-two of them, like a many-pointed star. From this he gets his name. His tail is a little longer than Miner's, and is hairy. During the late fall and winter, this becomes much enlarged. This funny little fellow with the star-like nose is especially fond of moist places, swamps, damp meadows, and the banks of streams. He is not at all afraid of the water and is a good swimmer. Sometimes he may be seen swimming under the ice in winter. He is seldom found where the earth is dry. For that matter, none of the family are found in those sections where there are long, dry periods and the earth becomes baked and hard. The fur of Miner and his cousins will lay in either direction, which keeps it smooth no matter whether the wearer is going forward or backward. Otherwise, it would be badly mused up most of the time. Altogether, these little underground workers are most interesting little people when you know them, but that is something few people have a chance to do. Now, just remember that the shrews and the moles belong to the order of insectivora, meaning eaters of insects, and are the only two families in that order. And don't despise either of them, for they do a great deal of good in the great world more than some right here whom I might name, but will not. School is dismissed. End of chapter 20、Chapter、21 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 21 Flitter the Bat and His Family. The Red Bat, Little Brown or Cave Bat, Big Brown or House Bat, Silvery Bat, Hoary Bat, and Big Eared Bat. In the dusk of early evening, as Peter Rabbit sat trying to make up his mind whether to spend that night at home in the dear old briar patch with timid little Mrs. Peter or go over to the green forest in search of adventure, a very fine, squeaky voice, which came right out of the air above him, startled him for a moment. "'Better stay at home, Peter Rabbit. Better stay at home tonight,' said the thin, squeaky voice. "'Hello, Flitter!' exclaimed Peter, as he stared up at a little dark form darting this way, twisting that way, now up, now down, almost brushing Peter's head, and then flying so high he could hardly be seen. "'Why should I stay at home?' "'Because I saw Old Man Coyote sneaking along the edge of the green forest.' Reddy Fox is hunting on the green meadows, and Hooty the Owl is on watch in the old orchard, replied Flitter the Red Bat. Of course, it is no business of mine what you do, Peter Rabbit, but were I in your place, I certainly would stay at home. Gracious, I'm glad I can go where I please when I please. You ought to fly, Peter. You ought to fly. There is nothing like it. I wish I could, sighed Peter. Well, don't say I didn't warn you, squeaked Flitter, and darted away in the direction of Farmer Brown's house. Peter wisely decided that the dear old briar patch was the best place for him that night, so he remained at home, to the joy of timid little Mrs. Peter, and spent the night eating, dozing, and wondering how it would seem to be able to fly like Flitter the Bat. Flitter was still in his mind when he started for school the next morning, and by the time he got there he was bubbling over with curiosity and questions. He could hardly wait for school to be called to order. Old Mother Nature noticed how fidgety he was. "'What have you on your mind, Peter?' she asked. "'Didn't you tell us that the shrew family and the mole family "'are the only families in this country in the order of insect-eaters?' asked Peter. 
I certainly did, was the prompt reply. Doesn't Flitter the Bat live on insects? asked Peter. Old Mother Nature nodded. He does, said she. In fact, he lives altogether on insects. Then why isn't he a member of that order? demanded Peter. Old Mother Nature smiled, for she was pleased that Peter had thought of this. That question does you credit, Peter, said she. The reason that he and his relatives are so very different from other animals that they have been placed in an order of their own. It is called the Chiroptera, which means wing-handed. How many of you know Flitter the Bat? I have often seen him, declared Jumper the Hare. So have I, said Chatterer the Red Squirrel. Each of the others said the same thing. There wasn't one who hadn't watched and envied Flitter darting about in the air just at dusk of early evening or as the black shadows were stealing away in the early morning. Old Mother Nature smiled. Seeing him isn't knowing him, said she. Who is there who knows anything about him and his ways save that he flies at night and catches insects in the air? She waited a minute or two, but no one spoke. The fact is there was not one who really knew anything about Flitter. It is one of the strange things of life, said she, that people often know nothing about the neighbors whom they see every day. But in this case it is not to be wondered at. I suspect none of you has seen Flitter, excepting in the air, and then he moves so rapidly that there is no chance to get a good look at him. I think this is just the time and place for you to really make the acquaintance of Flitter the Red Bat. She stepped over to a bush and parted the leaves. Hanging from a twig was what appeared at first glance to be a rumpled, reddish-brown dead leaf. She touched it lightly. At once it came to life, stirring uneasily. A thin, squeaky voice peevishly demanded to know what was wanted. You have some callers, a few of your friends who want to get really acquainted with you. Suppose you wake up for a few minutes, explained Old Mother Nature pleasantly. Flitter, for that is just who it was, yawned once or twice sleepily, shook himself, then grinned down at the wondering faces of his friends crowded about just under him. Hello, folks, said he in that thin, squeaky voice of his. The sunlight fell full on him, but he seemed not to mind it in the least. In fact, he appeared to enjoy its warmth. He was hanging by his toes, head down, his wings folded. He was about four inches long, and his body was much like that of a mouse. His fur was fine and thick, a beautiful orange-red. For his size, his ears were large. Instead of the long head and sharp nose of the mouse family, Flitter had a rather round head and blunt nose. Almost at once Peter Rabbit made a discovery. It was that Flitter possessed a pair of bright, little, snapping eyes, and didn't seem in the least bothered by the bright light. "'Where did that saying, blind as a bat, ever come from?' demanded Peter. Old Mother Nature laughed. "'Goodness knows I don't,' said she. "'There is nothing blind about Flitter.' He sleeps through the day and does his hunting in the dusk of evening or early morning, but if he is disturbed and has to fly during the day, he has no trouble in seeing. Flitter, stretch out one of your wings so that everybody can see it. Obediently, Flitter stretched out one of his wings. Everybody gasped, for it was the first time any of them ever had seen one of those wings near enough to know just what it was like. Flitter's arm was long, especially from his elbow to his hand but the surprising thing was the length of his three fingers. Each finger appeared to be about as long as the whole arm. From his shoulder a thin, rubbery skin was stretched to the ends of the long fingers, then across to the ankle of his hind foot on that side, and from there across to the tip of his tail. A little short thumb with a long curved claw stuck up free from the edge of the wing. Now you can see just why he is called wing-handed, explained Old Mother Nature, as Flitter folded the wing. In a minute he began to clean it. Everybody laughed, for it was funny to watch him. He would take the skin of the wing in his mouth and pull and stretch it as if it were rubber. He washed it with his tiny tongue. Then he washed his fur. You see, Flitter is very neat. With the little claw of his thumb he scratched his head and combed his hair. All the time he remained hanging head down, clinging to the twig with his toes. "'Where is Mrs. Flitter?' asked Old Mother Nature. "'Don't know,' replied Flitter, beginning on the other wing. She's quite equal to looking after herself, so I don't worry about her. Nor about your babies. Flitter, I'm ashamed of you. You are a poor kind of father, declared Old Mother Nature severely. If you don't know where to find your family, I'll show you. She stepped over to the very next tree, parted the leaves, and there, sure enough, hung Mrs. Flitter fast asleep. And clinging to her were three of the funniest babies in all the great world. All were asleep, 
and old mother nature didn't awaken them for as flitter he seemed to take not the slightest interest in his family but went right on with his toilet flitter the red bat is one of the best known of the whole family in this country said old mother nature as they left flitter to resume his nap he is found from the east to the far west from ocean to ocean like the birds he migrates when cold weather comes returning in the early summer Although, like all bats, he sleeps all day as a rule, he doesn't mind the sunlight, as you have just seen for yourselves. Sometimes, on dull, dark days, he doesn't wait for evening, but flies in the afternoon. Usually, he is the first of the bat family to appear in the evening, often coming out while it is still light enough to show the color of his red coat. No other member of his family has a coat of this color. Some people call him the tree bat. After seeing him hanging over there, I think you can guess why. He rarely goes to a cave for his daytime sleep, as most of his relatives do, but hangs by his toes from a twig of a tree or bush, frequently not far from the ground, just as he is right now. As all of you who have watched him know, Flitter is a swift flyer. This is because his wings are long and narrow. They are made for speed. I want you to know that the bats are among the most wonderful of all my little people. Few, if any, birds can equal them in the air because of their wonderful ability to twist and turn. They are masters of the art of flying. Moreover, they make no sound with their wings, something which only the owls among birds can boast of. You all saw the three babies clinging to Mrs. Flitter. Most bats have but two babies at a time, occasionally only one, but the red bat and his larger cousin, the hoary bat, have three or four. Mrs. Flitter carries her babies about with her until they are quite big. When they are too large to be carried, she leaves them hanging in a tree while she hunts for her meals. Flitter has many cousins. One of these is the little brown bat, one of the smallest members of the family and found all over the country. He is brown all over. He is sometimes called the cave bat, because whenever a cave is to be found, he sleeps there. Sometimes great numbers of these little bats are found crowded together in a big cave. When there is no cave handy, a barn or hollow tree is used. Often he will creep behind the closed blinds of a house to spend the day. Very like this little fellow in color is his cousin, the big brown bat, called the house bat and the Carolina bat. He is especially fond of the homes of men. He is a little bigger than the red bat. While the latter is one of the first bats to appear in the evening, the former is one of the last, coming out only when it is quite dark. He also is found all over the country. The silvery bat is of nearly the same size and in many places is more common than any of its cousins. The fur is dark brown or black with white tips, especially in the young. From this it gets its name. One of the largest and handsomest of the bat cousins, and one of the rarest, is the hoary bat. His fur is a mixture of dark and light brown, tipped with white. He is very handsome. His wings are very long and narrow and he is one of the most wonderful of all flyers. He is a lover of the green forest, and does his hunting high above the treetops, making his appearance late in the evening. Like the red bat, he spends the hours of daylight hanging in a tree. Down in the southeast is a member of the family with ears so big that he is called the big-eared bat. He is a little chap, smaller than little brown bat, and his ears are half as long as his head and body together. What do you think of that? For his size, he has the biggest ears of any animal in all this great country. A relative in the southwest is the big-eared bat. All members of the bat family are drinkers, and usually the first thing they do when they start out at dusk is to seek water. All live wholly on insects, and for this reason they are among the very best friends of man. They eat great numbers of mosquitoes. They do no harm whatever, which is more than can be said for some of the rest of you little folks. Now. Who shall we learn about next? End of chapter 21